Have you ever considered going franchise? I would say absolutely not until listening to some of your podcasts. This general manager has grown with the same dealership for over 20 years, but after building a wildly successful used car store, the question begs, what's next? Today, I'm speaking with Michael Kelly, general manager of Bourne's Auto Center, a progressive independent dealer group based out of Boston with over $125 million in annual sales. Don't forget to click subscribe so you never miss an episode. But before we get into the show, this episode is brought to you by Uber. Courtesy transportation is no longer a nice to have, it's a need to have. That's why 80% of dealership respondents agree that providing on-demand courtesy rides with Uber has helped retain customers based on Uber's survey of 79 organizations in 2023. With Central, you can request a ride on behalf of your customers even if they don't have the Uber app. Car dealerships are loving Uber for business because it's a headache-free solution for offering white glove service and seamlessly handling tasks like pickup and delivery of auto parts and replacing shuttles and loaner cars. Dealers can request one-way or round-trip rides, add multiple riders and locations, and even monitor trips in real time. Plus, you'll get monthly reports to keep track of everything. If you're ready to reduce the costs associated with maintaining shuttles and limit the liability of loaner vehicles, it's time to partner with Uber. Visit t.uber.com slash cdgauto today to learn more or visit the link in the show notes below. This episode is also brought to you by Cars Commerce, the platform to simplify everything about buying and selling cars, including the quote unquote follow up. Let me explain. Dealers, fast and effective follow up is crucial for converting leads into customers. But here's the problem 40% of shoppers report that they are not getting timely or helpful responses from dealerships. This is a huge problem because your own team could be leaving four out of every 10 sales opportunities on the table. Cars Commerce makes it simple to measure and improve your follow up performance. A Cars.com experience report tracks the percentage of leads your team is responding to and how customers rate those responses. While Dealer Inspire's retailing technology enables your team to quickly text follow ups with personalized financing options to make the most out of every opportunity. To learn more about how you can measure and improve your team's follow up performance, go to carscommerce.inc slash experience or click the link in the show notes below. Michael Kelly on the CDG podcast. Michael, welcome. Oh, great. Thanks for having me, Yossi. It's great to be here. Great to have you on. So I was looking through our old emails. You had initially reached out to me uh, September 2023. And you sent me something very really cool. You sent me this, uh, like the report that you do for your team, which my honest opinion was I was pretty impressed because, you know, I just, it was a pretty sophisticated report that, you know, call me by, I said, wow, okay, like this is a, you know, top-notch used car dealership, like good stuff, like the way you manage your team, at least it seems like on the outside. Anyways, then NADA, that was that whole thing, but then you sent me an email after NADA and it was really great because I, I told you, hey, like we should, you know, connect about doing a potential podcast. You had really included like your entire story and I love how you, you did it in like bullet point format. So that was, uh, it was great. It was like punchy concise. What I liked about your your email, which was cool, was that you had highlighted your rental car business and you're like, epic fail. <laughs> and I was like, sweet. Like, okay, cool. So we're going to have like a, a good, transparent conversation, you know? Sure. I'll put it all out there for you. So Michael, I, I want to start with the obvious, which is 20 years at one dealership. You're defying almost every dealership turnover metric. What's going on over here? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, going all the way back to, uh, how I kind of got my start in the business. So I was one year out of college, I was working at an insurance company, adjusting claims and, um, Jason Bourne, the, the owner here, uh, he had kind of reached out to me and I would known him because when I worked in high school in college, I worked for his buddy landscaping in the summer. Uh, and he knew I was like a hard worker and we had, we had met a few times and his sister, who's also, uh, an owner here and, and and works here as well was a couple years ahead of me in in high school, um, and he had a small used car lot here in in town. And um, he basically they were moving locations in a couple months, and he really wanted to grow the business, and he needed kind of somebody to come in and just kind of take over the sales team, um, and uh, or sales take over sales. No team, there was no team. He was the team, um, and so I did that. <laughs> um, and, I, and one of the reasons why I decided to kind of go in the auto business, which, you know, my college buddy's like, you're crazy. You're going to work on Saturdays. Like what, what, that's nuts. And, uh, but one of the things that I learned at the, the insurance company was like, we had these claims that we had to adjust. And, you know, if you did all your work and you, you were organized and you called all your people back, 
they would make you then like go in and work on the other people who were like really far behind. And I was like 21, 22 years old. And I'm like, I'm not, this is crazy. Like I want to, if I'm going to do that, I want to get incentivized for it. So I'm like, I really need to find a place where the harder I work, the more I'm going to get, you know, compensated. And it was a perfect fit. Um, so I just kind of took the ball and, and ran with it. Um, so we kind of grew it and, and I took it from when I started at the company, I mean, I really treated it like it was, it, I still do, like it's my own business. Um, so that, that just having that mentality right out of the gate is, has worked really well for us. Mm -hmm. So talk to us. So you started not much of a team today. Give us like a little by the numbers, just a, just a table set, right? Like what are your annual revenues units sold? Give us a little high level. Sure. So, um, Last year, we did uh, just shy of 3,000 retail units, about just over 4,000 total units in a wholesale. Um, that's all out of our Easton location. Um, so we do have, uh, so backing up a little bit, we do have our Easton location, um, which is our, our flagship um, dealership. We sell about 300 to 315 cars a month right now. We're on pace to actually do 330 this month, um, retail only. And um, we also have a reconditioning center, an offsite where we do all the offsite um, mechanicals, photo, clean, um, and then we store a bunch of cars there. It's about a half mile away from here. And then on top of that, we have a, a, a location called Car Bids, which is uh, it used to be ten thousand dollar and under cars. You know, trade ins that we took here, we're trying to get the lift over MMR. You know, trying to get like a fifteen to two thousand dollar lift over MMR, but might have a scratch, might have a dent. We do check them out, but it's more of you know cash and carry type of thing. Now that's more of a fifteen thousand dollar and under lot. <laughs> Sometimes a, even a little higher than that, but um, but there's a huge market for those cars as well. So um, so those are the three current locations that we have right now. Um, we annual revenue we're doing we're doing about one hundred and twenty five million in 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 revenue total everything and how many stores is that so that's pretty much one store here um you know doing everything out of heat right out of the eastern okay so so if i'm so just to recap this you have one main retail location that's your eastern location and then you have a reconditioning center and then you have uh like a value lot where you put these like twenty thousand and under cars correct got it i'm getting giddy because i have like a laundry list of questions so this is gonna be okay, so much no, fun also in the at the eastern location we have retail service and we have retail body shop as well ah okay so michael i think my like my hot take first of all is that not even not hot take sorry like my, my initial reaction is that you are the type of used car dealership that many used car dealers aspire to build um based on your size and scale and from what I could tell so thus far, again, from our prior conversation of how you manage your business, you've sort of taken this to the corporate level, all right? So we'll, we'll dig into that. Start us off, if you may, just your sales model. I know when you started, you had mentioned to me that you were cradle to grave. And of course, you know, you've evolved your team a ton since then. But just talk to us a little bit about how do you actually sell cars today at your dealership? What is your structure? So one of the, the biggest things that we did in 2003, we went to the fixed price, no haggle um, pricing model, all market based. We, we price very competitive to market, uh, you know, lower front end gross. Um, and, um, you know, obviously we rely a, a lot on the back end and then we have a, a pretty, pretty substantial documentation fee as well. But we went to that fixed price model. When I started in 2003, we visited like two or three CarMax locations before we went to it. And, and Jason was like, you gotta, you gotta see what these guys are doing down here. And, and, and kind of, we, we watched that and we kind of figured out, okay, we're, we're going to do this. And, and we literally will not negotiate a dollar, even if it's my best friend from high school or anything. That, that's 2003. I mean, you're talking about like pre like website adoption, right? Like that's like very early. What gave you the conviction to, to, to go fixed price so, so early? Like why, why do that? Well, obviously seeing what CarMax was doing and they were on a huge growth tra trajectory at the time. Also just the, the, the experience and being able to do that kind of volume, you need to, you know, it needs to be fast. Everything needs to be quicker. And we knew that the negotiation part was the part that took, a, that takes a long time in the car buying process. So 
uh, especially back in, in that time, it was common for a person to spend, you know, two to three hours in a dealership. So everything that we've always done has been volume, 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 and speed. We've, we've been, we try to get somebody in and out of here in 45 minutes as soon as they say they want to buy the car. So now fast forwarding again, what are your, what are your margins today? You mentioned, you know, low in the front, bigger back, a, a substantial dock fee. Can you kind of take us through your, your margins on the front end, back end, everything? Sure. I mean, they vary. Obviously, the front end varies. <laughs> average, month month. average. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Averaging right now, aft. So this is where you kind of you can get into the weeds on this, and you know this with your used car background, right? I love, so I love the weeds. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so all you know, we're about eight hundred bucks on the front end, um, and last month our back end was a little bit off, but we 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 strive for about fifteen hundred on the back, um, and then we have a documentation fee that we we ended up raising. Uh, think it was towards the middle or end of last year to to 584 um so you know all in you're looking at somewhere you know around so about 2800 bucks per unit and the other thing is getting into the weeds is the reconditioning right so we're spending on average which was going to be my next question yes go ahead right so so we're spending about 900 to a thousand dollars per car in reconditioning, right? Our, our 115 point inspection, if the brakes are less than 50%, we replace them tires less than five, you know, five, 30 seconds, we'll replace those. Um, so, but there is a markup in that as well. Um, so th that's where, <laughs> and that's when you want to compare yourself to other dealers or some of these other public companies and say what they're doing per copy or per, well, are you tagging your transport to that car? Are you, you know, what are you, what, what are you putting into that, to that, or what are you stripping out? <laughs> it's maybe the better question. Um, so, so that there is some, there is some money uh, baked in into that as well. So let's break down the reconditioning, right? I think a lot of people just don't really know what happens behind the scenes at this level of detail. Um, so you're saying roughly a thousand dollars into every car on average. We know that some are 500, some are 2000. But tell me like what goes into that $1000 on average? And then also I'm surprised to hear you say that there's profit baked into that. I'm curious to know also how much of that is profit because I have only ran reconditioning centers as cost centers. There was never any markup. It was strictly a cost center. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, just it's a different model. So I'm curious to know how how you do it. Sure. I've, I've kind of argued to do it at a cost model as well. But, you know, when you've got when we first got started and we have accountants, no, this is the way dealerships do it. You got to make money. And one of the things that was the absolute fuel to our fire was when we separated our customer pay service department from internal. As soon as we separated that, we just we we took off um, because we were having a hard what, time. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Explain that to us. Explain that. So at, you know, for a long period of time before we opened the offsite reconditioning center, our service department here was dealing with customer pay stuff, service contract stuff, used car policy stuff, you know, person buys a car, um, they've got an issue the next day, you got to get that car right in. So oftentimes our lot cars would get pushed, you know, to the back burner because obviously there's no one really complaining about that. So we've learned that, you know, having the offsite reconditioning center time to market is much, much faster. They don't touch any customer cars and it's just a production. It's, it's a used car factory in terms of getting the cars to the front line. Tell me, so before I move on, I, I want to, I want to talk to you about setting this up, which I, I think is also very relevant for lots of dealers, especially as you're amping up your used car business and you want to be competitive. You see what a lot of people don't think through is that you run your, if you're, you know, a franchise dealer, Clearly, you know, you're running your your used car reconditioning through service. Unless you have, you know, some adjusted rates, it's you're not competitive and you just can't do that in this market. And you'd be surprised. I mean, I still talk to some, you know, groups or dealers that just operate that way, where their used cars run through service at normal rates. So what happens is they end up actually sending lots of cars to auction or, the, you know, it, 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 it's just, the system the doesn't work. You know what I mean? And so... So before I ask you about setting something like this up, tell me about, uh, I just want to, I want to close the loop on that question of the costs that get baked into that thousand dollars, right? Of that, like how much is labor, uh, you know, how much is body work, everything. I mean, kind of however much you can drill down and break that down for us. Sure. So, I mean, we do, we do now give ourselves a little bit of a discounted rate in 
in the internal shop. So if our, our retail labor rate is $149, they're doing it at $95 an hour. Um, and then you can figure out, you know, what service technicians get paid from there. So I'd say, you know, the breakdown on the, on the profit side of it is, you know, we probably have a 40% margin on the parts that we buy, the aftermarket parts that we put on. Um, and then, you know, you're looking at probably, you know, the hundred percent margin on the, on the labor part of that. Um, so it comes out to the, the profit that's probably break baked into a thousand dollar RO is probably about four hundred dollars, I would say. Talk to me about sourcing parts. How are you doing that? All aftermarket, I would have to assume. Yeah, mostly aftermarket. Um, more, more and more, you know, stuff has to come from the dealers. A, a, a large part of those reconditioning costs are tires. Tires drive, drive the recondition. I mean, tires prices are have uh, just gone through the roof. Um, and, and so a lot of that is driven by, by tires. We, we try to lay off the major body, body work stuff. Um, so there's not a lot of body work in there. I think like right now with, we have about a hundred cars that need, that are in the, in process right now, only about 40 of those have some sort of minor body work. So, uh, only about 30 to 40% of the cars actually go through the body shop. This episode is brought to you by my very own car dealership guy, industry job board. CDGjobs.com, my industry job board connecting the best talent in automotive with the best companies, will remain absolutely free for CDG listeners to post and fill available roles at their companies. This free job board is for anyone in automotive, vendors, dealers, lenders, manufacturers, auto tech, everyone. Already, over 100 companies have posted open positions, including Lithia Motors, Recurrent, Credit Acceptance, Vero's Credit, Cars Commerce, Shift Digital, Plug, Full Path, Westlake, Trade Pending. You get the point. The best part is that when these companies hire through cdgjobs.com, they are hiring the most informed candidates in the marketplace. So don't hesitate. You can add your open roles today by visiting cdgjobs.com or clicking the link in the show notes below. That's cdgjobs.com. And then how are you managing this reconditioning center? So in 2015, um, I got approval from Jason to go out and build uh, our own reconditioning software to manage the process. Got it. Okay, so tell us more about that. What was that process like? Why do that? Why not use a third party software? Like, give us, give give us the the full the full scoop. So back in 2014, 2015, there wasn't um, 50 to 100 different recon people at NADA at the time. There, there are were hardly any. Um, and so when I first started thinking about it, um, you know, I, I thought that there would be a huge value to kind of build something the way that we thought it should be done and that was catered to us. And I mean, there's so many software solutions, CRMs, DMSs that are built, but they, they're not built for your organization. They're built for everyone's organization. And there's so many pieces of it that you don't use or don't need. Um, so it's been a very, very powerful uh, tool. And we had a lot of input from the team here to, that that actually helped you know build it so they they're they're bought into it you know big time um you know we've got our our body shop foreman tim i mean he still has a flip phone but he uh he loves that that you know but he was involved in you know helping helping design how it was going to work for him and um so uh but to, to get back to how we went about doing that i posted a a, a gig on craigslist and found a guy <laughs> that's how Legend. I did. I love it. And yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's just so scrappy. But so is this, do you like who, who, talk, like how much has this cost you, this software, this custom recon software? How much does that cost you? Um, you know, I still pay them a small amount a month to kind of maintain it. And we, when, if we need any like small updates, it's been very, very minimal. I would say the initial investment that we put into it, you know, all in was probably somewhere around a hundred thousand. Um, so if you extrapolate that over the amount of months, <laughs> far less than we'd be paying for any, any software solution now. So we, we also, we also kind of, I would say maybe four years ago, um, we added to the software, um, to manage moving vehicles. So because, uh, our lot here where, where, you know, Massachusetts is real estate is extraordinarily expensive. Um, and it, there's not much of it. Um, so essentially if we have we don't have all of our cars here on the lot so if a customer comes down and they want to look at two or three jeep wranglers jeep grand cherokees we use the software to manage okay 
we need the salesperson will request the car. It'll send the, the, the lot attendant a text message. This car needs to be moved as soon as he gets the car over at our other at our recon center to get it to bring it over to this lot. It sends the salesperson alert back, tells him, hey, Mario, car's on the way. And you can tell the customer, hey, the car's on the on its way over. Uh, so that that's been uh, a big part of it, too. We used to manage that via just texting back and forth, and that just wasn't going to work. And and I know I know the pain and I know the feeling, so it doesn't doesn't surprise me. Um, all right, so so it's great insight into recon. I want to transition first uh, to the to the value lot. This is again another another concept that lots of people in the industry dabble with, which is, you know, we we take all these you know cheaper kind of sketchy cars to the auction that we probably don't want to retail and put our brand behind. Well, should we set up a value lot? And it's not. It's associated with us, but it's a different name and there's different, you know, vehicle warranties and blah, 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 right? So you're not taking that reputational risk, plus you're offering a different type of insurance after the fact. So, I mean, what has been your thinking with this value lot, number one? And then if you could also share the economics of the value lot, right? Because I'd have to imagine margins are, you know, very different than your primary lot. Yeah, so uh, the value lot... um you know, they'll, we, they, we, we will retail as many trade-ins here at the, at our Bourne's lot that we can. Um, but we also know that there's a huge affordability market, even before used car prices went up that, you know, there, there are people, I mean, how many, how many times do you have a friend? Hey, I need a car for my daughter. You know, I need this, I need that. Um, but we really, we, we quickly learned, and I know that there's been some dealerships that have tried to, you know, put different types of cars on the same lot and say, this is a, this is this car, this is a value car, but our salespeople, they're just, they, they, they just couldn't differentiate between the two. So we separated church and state. We send it over there. Uh, we do, like I said, we do still check them out. We do still do want to sell a good car. We still do stand behind the car. Um, if there's any issues, um, but it is um, very controlled. Uh, there's, there's two people that work over there. They know what to say to the customers and, you know, how to set the table and let them know exactly what they're buying and, and what the, 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 the scenario is. The margins are very, very, they're much, much higher. Uh, I believe last month, uh, there is virtually no back end um, because it, it's mostly cash and carry or outside finance. Um, or like personal loans and stuff like that. Um, so we don't really makes, do makes much sense. of that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really, like I said, a cash and carry. Um, and they're, I think last month they were averaging somewhere right around $2,500, um, a car, um, not surprising uh, on the front end. Yeah. And then we don't yeah, do I mean, adopt cheap cars. There. We let, we let the customer go to the registry on their own. It's, it's no frills. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was going to, what are the core differences, right? So, you let the customer do the docs on themselves. Why, why do you decide to do that? Well, because, it, it, you know, <laughs> Massachusetts is, is a little difficult with registering and titling. I don't know if you've experienced that at all. But uh, so we have the registry right here at the dealership in, in Easton. Um, and there's all sorts of things that kind of go in along with that in terms of auditing and all, you know. So we just didn't want to get involved in any of that. So it's more or less, you know, if we don't, if we don't charge a doc fee, we don't do anything, then we'll just give the customer all the correct paperwork and say, here, take it to your insurance agent, and then take it to the registry. And it's so that, 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 but all of those expectations are set up front and that's what's most important. Yeah. You just, you brought back memories because you're right. I do remember us delivering cars, delivering, obviously not selling, you know, physically, but delivering to Massachusetts and there was there was always some challenges with that. So it's, uh, it does bring back some memories. And if anyone from those times that, you know, worked with me during those days is listening right now, I have to imagine <laughs> some people are, they're probably smiling right now because they remember this as well. So good times. I love how you've just taken you know, cars that would have otherwise gone to wholesale and how you would have left money on the table. And, you know, you're, you're actually making something out of it, retailing it, and expanding your margins very smart i mean their turn their turn is like 100 percent. what it, they they're selling cars so quickly it's 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 actually amazing <laughs> it's pretty amazing i mean if you could actually go out and source those cars and and, and have a hundred of them i mean talk about what you could do <laughs> but oh, obviously yeah. sourcing sourcing those cars uh it, it, at auctions and things like that is very very difficult yeah got it and then what about your appraisal process how do you do that we're using first look right now. Um, we have, we have dabbled a little bit with V auto. 
Um, and first look, just um, it, it's actually Max now, Max Max Digital, which is owned by ECV, um, and they've actually um, in, implemented their Clear Car uh, into their software, which has been very very helpful to for us to have a more um, sort of transparent and um, online appraisal. Um, for our customers, we used so many different online ones. The customer would come in with three different numbers, one from KBB, one from, you know, we were using a uh, car offer at one point. I mean, so now with, 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 uh, Max, we're, we're in a pretty good spot, um, with, you know, if somebody submitted their online trading value, we know it. <laughs> Whereas before we'd give them a number in the store and then they'd pull out a piece of paper and say, your, your website told us that. And we're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> you know, So then you kind of got to backtrack. So we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, and and that, that the transparency, too, I mean, going back to the no hassle pricing, I mean, that's um, one of the things that's, you know, really, really helped is just the transparency with the pricing transparency. We, we, we give the customers the internal reconditioning, tell them exactly what we did to the car, really a value build on, on that. Yeah. Tell me more about that. What do you, what do you actually show the customer? I've long had this like idea of taking reconditioning transparency to the next level. I just think that it talk, you talk about building trust with a customer at like a next level. We're already showing them the hot spots on the car of like the scratches and all that. Why not actually, not, and, and by the way, like I don't mean just like telling them like, oh, we replaced your whatever brakes, but like if you can show part of that, I just think there's um, there's something, you know, unique to that experience. And look, service centers all across the country, right? They'll, at this point, if you put your car in for service, at, you know, a franchise dealership typically, you know, you will be able to get videos and pictures and stuff like that, which I think is a great way to engage the customer. Uh, but I I'm curious to know how you actually share reconditioning with customers and how you use that to your advantage in the sales process. So that's actually changed recently. Um, so we used to, um, so while the customer was out on a drive, we would actually print up everything that they would want for the vehicle, you know, the Carfax report, you know, the, we would give them our internal repair order and we would start the value build and the presentation rate when they got back from, from the drive. So for us, it was all about a value build because we're not going to be able to negotiate on the price. So we got to build value in the car and we got to build value in buying a vehicle from us and what makes us different than other dealerships. So, um, so the reconditioning is obviously a huge part because you don't want to compare our car to a car at another dealership that maybe they didn't, doesn't have new tires or it doesn't have brakes, or you don't even know what they did do to the vehicle. So we used to actually print that out and give it to them when they would come back from the test drive. We actually switched at NADA. Um, I, I went with the company called iPacket, um, and iPacket is now right on our website. So now the customers are actually able to drill in and see the service RO right on the website. So we're actually being able to build value before the customer get, even gets in store. Mm -hmm. Got it. Tell me more about your sales process while we're on this topic, right? Like, can you like break it down to, you know, five to 10 steps? What is your sales process? I think you just made a good point that you have, like you sort of have this forcing function where you can't negotiate price. So you have to build value, which I think is a beautiful thing because it gets your team trained into good habits, right? You have to build value. We all know the easier thing to do in any case is to always to lower the price, right? right? Exactly. That's the easy thing to do. And so it's a cool, like it's a cool environment to be in where you like have no choice but to build value if you want to make a sale happen. But what is your sales process? And and is it something that like you came up with? Like where who inspired your sales process? That's like a twofold question. So uh, yeah, I mean, I would say yeah, I came up with it. Um, we, we've been very, very fortunate. So the... <laughs> The first person I ever hired in my hiring career back in 2003, uh, David Pear, he still works for us today. Uh, he was the first person I ever hired. I was 22 years old and I hired somebody and I hired Dave and he still works here <laughs> to this day. Now, I made a lot of mistakes in between Dave and today, but <laughs> Dave, Dave's still here. Um, so our sales staff is very, very seasoned. I think our lowest, you know, least tenured salesperson has been here for three years. Um, so, uh, but we built the process kind of together. Uh, myself, we have, we have a great uh, GSM, Carlos. He's been with us for over 10 years. Um, one of our finance managers, Sean, has been here for 17 years. So this process has kind of evolved, but it's speed. Um, when the customer, we don't go on the drive with them. We have uh, five salespeople, five salespeople selling 315 cars right now. 
two delivery coordinators. So they assist the sales team with any, anything that needs to be done uh, with the vehicle, making sure the registration, everything's good. Uh, every, you know, just whatever they need, the liaison between them and, and getting the customer, getting the car delivered. We have four finance managers uh, and a sales manager. And yes, I do still go up and sell cars myself. Uh, I think I have eight or nine out this month myself. Uh, I don't pass them off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the delivery coordinators, David will step up. Dave, I mean, the book of business that he has, he grew up here in town as well, uh, is pretty strong. So he's got a big, big repeat and referral business. So the process is, you know, the customer will come in, you know, about 50% right now of our customers set an appointment before they come in, which is pretty interesting. Uh, Pre-COVID, it was like 30%. And 70% of the people would just show up. Then during COVID, it flipped to 70% would make an appointment and 30% would show up. And now it's kind of gone down to 50-50. Uh, so if we have the appointment set, of course, we're going to have the car pulled you know, pulled over to the side. We know the appointments are coming. Um, any car they want to look at, if they want to look at three cars, we'll have them all here for them uh, and, and ready to go. If they didn't set the appointment, um, you know, we'll get them going. We get them checked in at the front desk. We get them entered into the CRM. Uh, right at the front desk, we have a check-in area. They go through, they scan them in. So the sales team doesn't have to do that. We'll round robin them. Um, and then uh, as, while the customer, well, they'll get the customer on the drive. While the customer's out in the drive, they're doing up the whole breakdown of what it's going to cost to the car. If they have a trade-in, we're getting all that information up front. We will have the trade appraised by the time they get back from the drive. All in the salesperson will already have it and have all the numbers. Um, and then um, he'll get the commitment. He or she will get the commitment. And then um, we'll get the application going. We'll get them into finance um, and we'll, we'll get them in and out as, as quick as we can. Uh, what's interesting about Massachusetts um, on the used car side, and I don't know, you know, if it was this way for you when you uh, it sort of had a brick and mortar store. Um, but uh, a lot of very, I would say like 20 percent of the customers take the car all in one shot. Massachusetts customers are accustomed to. Um, buying the car or paying for the car and then coming back and picking up at a later date. And I think that that has a lot to do with the registry challenges. And that's just the way it's always been, uh, even though it's gotten better and we can actually what we call spot the car and we incentivize the sales team to do that. Um, but only about 20% of the people actually take it on the spot. So you're telling me that people buy a car at your store, four out of five people buy a car at your store and they leave without the car, and then they come back to pick it up after the deal is funded? Uh, whenever they want. We don't wait. We don't require it to be funding unless it's a, a real So, so what do they deal. wait for? Why don't, why don't they take the deal right away? Yeah, it's just the kind of the mentality. Oh, you know, I'll come back and pick it up on Tuesday. All right, we'll see you Tuesday and we'll get it, you know, one final clean. But we can do all of that right on the spot. It's just it's just the way that it is. It, it It's just different because we did have a store in Florida and we can get into that. But they, that is not the way that people were. People were to take it right then. And I think a big part of it is there's no temporary tags in Massachusetts. So that's the way car buying has been in Massachusetts for a long time. I mean, <laughs> I'm like dumbfounded. This this is like, it's like my brain is just like a short circuiting right now. It's like people, it's an emotional purchase. Like people want the car now, and you're telling me that four out of five people buy a car at a used car store in Massachusetts and they don't. So when do they pick it up? How many days after? Eh, one, two, sometimes four, five. And and after the one, two, three, four, five days, has anything changed whatsoever? Forget the fact that you maybe vacuumed the car an extra time. Has anything changed? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, now you taught me something new because this is I like if you told me this like hey, Yossi, do you think this could work? Like would this business model work? <laughs> I would have laughed you out the door. By the way, I, I don't no want chance. it. To, I want them to yeah, take it right then, you know? And we don't have a lot of backout. We don't have a lot of backouts cuz that's that would be the fear, right? Oh, they got to take it today. They might back out. They might think about it more. You know, it's, it's not that way. It's, uh, even, it's yeah, not, not even backing out just like the, the fact that it's like you buy a car, you kind of need it. Uh, but Hey, so I think that let, I want to transition that to the next question, which I think I have an answer for based on what you just told me. Uh, but who are your customers? Like, talk to me about like income levels, like credit, like who are your customers? Uh, so we, yeah, we, we have a lot of good credit. Um, it's not a, it's not a subprime, um, uh, business. Um, I and mean, we do it, don't get me wrong. And, uh, but, um, I would say, 
I don't have the demographics on the customer, but you know, I would say most of it is, is middle, middle class, you know, um, we're in a, we, I mean, we're in a, a very populated area. We're 25 miles South of Boston. Um, income levels are high. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, they're, they're a strong customer, um, and customers, you know, a lot of people around here buy used cars. Um, you know, that was kind of the way I grew up. I did not going all the way back to my history. I, I did not grow up in the car business. I didn't really like cars, but my parents always bought used cars, low mileage used cars. Um, so, and I think that that's, uh, been that way here for, for a while and they buy them and they will buy them from independence and they don't buy, they, they don't, um, you franchise dealers don't sell as many used cars, um, in Massachusetts as they do like in Florida. Why, why, why do you think that is here? I don't know. I've, I've wondered about that. Um, I, maybe for a long time, the, the franchise dealers, they weren't really focused on it. Um, I think they, you know, I'm going way, way back. Um, but um, there's in our area there, there have been, you know, some reputable um, used car operators. So um, mm -hmm. I think that that might have something to do with it. It's all, you know, reputation, you know, um, yeah, of course, we're big, we're big on the reviews. We've we were dealer rater, uh, which is now a cars commerce um, a, a company was founded in Massachusetts. Uh, we were an early adopter to that. I think we got over 5,000 reviews with them Wow! Uh, now. Um, and we, we, we pushed the Google reviews as well. And, um, that's, that's been something that reviews have, have been great for, you know, independence because it gives you, you know, it, it lets people know that you care and that, you know, that you're not just going to tell them to go pound it if they have an issue. And if they do have an issue that you're going to address it. Right. So that's, that's important too. I respond to all the reviews personally. Um, so good, bad, or indifferent, I respond to them. Um, not necessarily to, to get them to change it, but just to let people know, Hey, we're reading these. So if you have an issue, we, we, we are going to try to fix of it. Of course. Why do you think people come to your store? Like what is the value proposition that you're marketing out there? Right. You mentioned reviews. I have to imagine your experience is a big part of it. Um, but again, you're clearly not the cheapest price in town. You don't even negotiate. So that's a, you know, you've, let's scratch that off the list. Why do people shop at your store? How are you driving traffic? We we are market based. Our prices are competitive. We are watching it every day. Um, competitive, so, not not the cheapest, and 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 I mean that in a positive way. You're not no, like I trying get, yeah. to under. You're not undercutting the market. You know, selling cars. You know, thousand below front end. Like yeah, right, right. Yeah, no, we we are market based, and we have been for a while. So they know they're getting a good value. Um, I mean, our repeat and referral business is about 50% of our business month in and month out. Um, so, you know, you're talking, you know, 30 to 40% of our customers have bought from us before, um, or, and then the, the rest, you know, 20%, somebody sent them down to buy from us. Um, I think there's something to the longevity of the staff being that when you come in and you're like, wow, Dave's here. Dave's still here. Dave's been here for 20 years, man. I mean, that's, you know, that tells <laughs> you that the place is good, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, so I think that that just kind of builds on itself over time. Um, and, you know, we do pay attention, um, very close attention to um, Car Gurus is really big up in this area um, as a third party lead source. They're our number one, probably third, though they are our number one. Uh, that is also a Massachusetts based company. Um, so we really pay attention to their deal ratings and, and how our vehicles are marketed on, on, on those websites. And, um, I think that that drives a lot of business as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, I was going to, it's funny. I was going to ask you about how you're doing handling employee retention. I want to actually skip that question and go to the, <laughs> go to the, the, the one that's connected to it, which is you said you have five salespeople selling over 300 cars a month. How much are your salespeople making? So Mario is our top salesperson. Um, he will probably sell about 80 cars this month. Uh, he started here as a runner, uh, as a lot attendant, as we call them. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So he started as a lot attendant. Um, we have another, uh, salesperson that started in the reconditioning, like cleaning the cars. Uh, he's in the sales department, uh, as well. Uh, we typically don't take salespeople that have prior automotive experience cause it just, it really just doesn't work. Uh, Bad for habits. Our model. Yeah. So, and, and they know too much, right? So we don't pay off the gross. We pay a low base 
Um, and then we pay a flat per car. Uh, and then we pay spiffs, you know, if they take the customer takes the car that day, we'll pay them a spiff if they finance it, pay them a spiff if they buy a warranty, because we want them to kind of set the table for that at the at the sales desk, not talk too, too much about it, but set the table for it. Uh, and then if they get to certain volume levels, then then they start to make even more, um, you know, not retro back, but, you know, once they get over a certain yes. number of cars, 30 plus cars, 35 plus cars, then they'll they'll make mer- more per car. Um, the other thing that we do that I don't know if is unique in the industry or not, because as an independent, as you know, we don't have 20 groups. I, I There's not a lot of people I can kind of rap with about the business. That isn't my direct competition, you know? <laughs> so you just said that. And it's funny because like whoever's listening to this, if you're an independent that wants to be part of an independent 20 group, shoot me an email, right? Let's do it. Michael, let's set, let's set this thing up. I, I, I've thought about it. I actually, you, I think you may have seen, like I tweeted about this like six months ago, but I just think like, we just got to make this happen. You're right. Like independents don't have these like great 20 groups that are, you know, super known and ubiquitous. I think it's a great idea. So if you're an independent, listen to this and you'd be want to, you want to get better. You'd want to be part of this. Hannah Motors, just shoot me an email. We can get him. We'll get Hannah Motors on. We'll yeah. Get, you know, yeah. We'll let's do it. it Why not? Let, let's, let's have Easterns, some fun. Let's have, know? yeah, let's get, I'm calling them out. Uh, uh, yeah, I've absolutely. gone a bit. I've, I've visited. If there is a large used car dealer, I've I've visited it. I've been to H. Greg. I used to stop at off lease only every time I flew in and out of Orlando. I've been to Texas Direct. <laughs> I've been to CarMax. I've been to almost oh all God. of them. Y- yeah. You're a student of the business, man. You're a, you're a sponge. I love it. You just you just love learning. It's great. We talked about how you wholesale vehicles. Talk to me about acquisition. Like, what are your core acquisition channels? Where are you bringing your used cars from? Yeah. So anything we can trade, like I said, those are those, that's the bread and butter. If we can buy off the street, we'll buy off the street. We don't do a great job of that. I mean, we do, you know, it, it is something that we do. We've tried doing a bunch of different things with it. Um, uh, right now we're doing a little bit with, with gurus on sell my car and trying to be the backstop there on, on what the number they're putting in and, and buying some cars through them. So anything we can acquire outside of the traditional auction, we're trying to do that, right? Because you save on transportation, you save on the auction buy fees. Um, there's just a lot of savings with that. Um, so the, that, that would be number one. I mean, we are, we do buy a lot from, um, you know, Mannheim. Um, we're a big Mannheim buyer. Uh, we buy, uh, there is an independent auction, uh, another shout out, uh, Southern Auto Auction out in um, Connecticut. Uh, it's a great auction. Um, we buy, we're probably, we're always kind of in the top 10 buyers at, at that auction um, out there in, in, in Connecticut. Uh, and then we do a lot on OVE smart auction. Um, we do a lot on there, a little bit of ACV. Um, but that, 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 that's where we're, we're acquiring from anywhere and everywhere that we can. We do also buy, um, we do buy from dealers to, um, direct. So there are some dealers up here that will do some sort of sealed bid auctions, um, or, or, or bank the cars. It's kind of going away now with kind of the, ACVs and the back lots and stuff like that, but there's, there are still some, um, and then, you know, off brand stuff. And, um, so we, we, we do do some of that as well. Uh, and closing the loop on the salesperson question. So if I'm selling like 35, 40 cars at your lot, am I making 150 a year, a hundred a year? What am I making in between those two numbers? Yeah. So I think again, and I think the combination of the way you run your store Again, as a as a bystander here, right? The way you run your store and the income that your salespeople are making, I think that is a, it's a it's clearly a winning formula. I mean, you have crazy retention, which is like unfathomable um, in this industry. It's very rare to retain you know quality employees for that long, uh, but you know they're making great income. It's it's really good to hear. We're looking to add probably two. Um, we've got the volume back to like a more consistent level, um, so. Um, You know, but what's amazing is like on a Saturday, we will see between 40 and 50 customers come through the door. Um, And with the five salespeople, the two delivery coordinators, um, you know, Carlos chipping in, we get those customers in and out. And that the fact that they're all so experienced is the fact that they can manage that. I mean, you are expected to manage three or four customers at one time. So how are they doing that effectively? Yeah, they just the way, you know, getting one customer out on the test drive, you know, communicating with them, letting them know. 
Uh, we always say, you know, some people will be like, wow, man, you, you're probably losing some customers there. And we, we, we might be. However, would you rather go eat at a restaurant that's empty or would you rather go eat at a restaurant that's slamming busy? So the busyness. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Said, wow. All these okay. people are here. All these people are here. There's something to this place that, you know, and we'll hear the customers talking, you know, around the showroom and saying, oh, this is my third car. This is my fourth car. And I'm just like, oh, just like smile ear to ear. I'm like, they're selling it for us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I get it. I think that, you know, the store would still be busy if you had another salesperson. So mm-hmm. um, I do I do get the point. I mean, I know you help them on the floor. I, I have. So how many desk managers do you have or like finance managers? How many do you have? Four finance managers. I, I can see how this can work where, you know, one customer moves on to the finance manager, one customer is on a test drive. One day. Okay. Okay. You know, we, may, we might want to add, you know, one or two salespeople still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it kind of, we had some, we had, a, a you know, a couple leave and we just didn't, it, we're very picky, like about who we bring on. So we're actually training a runner or a lot attendant right now um, to see if maybe he's going to work out. And we love doing that. Uh, I mean, down here in our accounting uh, office here, uh, two of them started as receptionists, you know, in our registration office, same started as receptionists. So we we really like that. Our service manager started as a lot attendant. So it's uh, we 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 really like to to try to grow our own. Talk to me about this fl- inventory carrying costs floor plan. How are you doing that? How are you sustaining it right now? Turn time, like give us the whole lay of the land. Yeah, so we we've gotten honed in and tracking how how many cars we can sell in the first thirty days. That's everything, right? Even wholesale trade ins, everything we want to everything we can sell within thirty days. You know, so if we can do, we're, we're, we're our goal is to try to get fifty percent of our cars to sell within thirty days. You know, we're running right around forty two percent right now. So that's number one. You sell the car quickly. If it's on floor plan, you're not going to have to pay as many carrying costs on that. Um, so we, that's one way to do it. We're also, uh, I actually looked it up. Our um, February of 2023 was our high water mark for uh, floor plan expense. It was like 67000 for the month. You know, you're talking like February 2023. 2023, yeah. Our floor and plan. How, do, you, do, do you know how many cars that was? Like what your rate was? Uh, I don't know those, like those specific counts, but I know that the dollar amount uh, on was probably around 10 million, something like that. Um, so of right, inventory yes. of inventory, total dollar. Um, so right now what we've also done is that we're just trying to pay, pay cash for as many cars as we can. Um, so we've gotten that number down to, um, you know, I think we, the low watermark was December of 2023. We had it down to like 25,000 a month. And last month we were somewhere right around 38,000. So we're owning about probably about half of our inventory right now. Outright. So you need to sell it fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I cannot. For both reasons. When you own a cash, you need to sell it fast. When you're financing it, you need to sell it fast. Now, when you said we're owning, so that's cash from the balance sheet. What's the ownership? Like, are you an owner of the business? Are you a managing partner? Are you the GM? Like, how does that work? I'm a GM. I, I've never really understood. Again, no 20. I don't really understand what managing partner means. Um, nobody's ever really kind of said to me, uh, okay, this is a structure of a managing partner. I don't really know what that means. Um, so I, I am the general manager. Um, you know, uh, I do not own a, a part of the business. You want to talk about Florida a little bit? What happened down there? Talk to me about Florida. What happened in Florida? And, and, and set the table here because you mentioned like you had a store there. You closed the store there. Give us some context. What happened in Florida? All right. So I, we've always long thought and still do think that former dealerships, the facilities are great for independence, right? So I would just search on LoopNet all the time up and down the East Coast for, I just do keyword dealership. And I just look to see what's out there. So I found a Mercedes dealership in Daytona Beach, Florida on LoopNet form. And the place looked beautiful. Location looked great. It was, you know, it was east of 95. It was in between where all the dealerships were. So I sent it, I sent the email to Jason, not thinking anything, you know, nothing's going to happen of it. So about three or four hours later, he called me or came into my office. I can't remember. And he goes, we're going to Daytona. I go, when? He goes, tomorrow. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. So we, we met the brokers down there and uh, we ended up putting a deal together and uh, buying it. So it was the former Mercedes Benz of Daytona. Uh, they moved out to the auto mall. A uh, couple little, a couple, couple quick little nuggets. We'll give some more shout outs. So uh, Daytona is the land of Terry Taylor. Uh, his first dealership was in Daytona. Uh, he owns all the deal, most of the dealerships in Daytona. Um, and the, that Mercedes Benz store had some crazy history. It was owned by uh, Sonic at one time. <laughs> where they had their corporate offices there. It was owned by the Higginbotham's at one time. Uh, so it's, it had a lot of history. It was, it was, it's a beautiful store. Uh, so anyway, so we, we were like, you know, the cost of that store, what we paid for the real estate, and if that store was up here, it would have been five or six times what we paid for it. So we were looking at the numbers. We're like, if we can just sell 100 cars here, I mean, which we could do easily, I mean, this is a no-brainer. And it was, and, um, and it, it was great. And, uh, I went down there for five months in 2016, opened the store. My kids were little, so it was great. The time it worked out great. It was January to May. So I mean, there was nothing better than that. Um, so we, we went down and we, uh, we got the store flying and it was great. It was exciting. Uh, it, it started off as a rock ship. It was flying. Um, but you know, we ran into some, some challenges in the, in the market, um, credit, being one um what, what was year was this specifically this was uh the store opened in 2016 so you what did you have a lot of subprime credit that you weren't used to or we what yeah we just weren't able to get it, a lot of it we weren't able to get approved yeah so you didn't have the right lenders yeah yeah or any lenders <laughs> there was some of it was you know the the a lot of I read an article at, at, at one time, um, and it was about one of the publics that had tr tried to that do standalone um, used dealerships. And they said that th in Florida, what they noticed was is that the, the customers with good credit buy used cars from the franchise dealers, not from the independents. And I thought that was interesting. And we definitely experienced some of that. The other thing that was interesting about Florida, right? So we're 50% repeat and referral up here. We had nothing. We started from zero. We have no brand loyalty. We have we had nothing down there. Uh, so, and all you rely on is your people. The problem is, is that like 70% of the people that work for us down there, nobody's from there. <laughs> like they all move there. <laughs> so it's like nobody grew up, you know, I think we had one employee who went to like Daytona, you know, mainland high school. Like, I mean, so they had like, they have not, they didn't have any friend, like didn't have anybody to bring us, no network, uh, you yeah. know, business. Yeah. No network. And, and we, and we rely heavily on that here. I think you touch on a couple of key points here for the used car business, which is number one, from what I've seen, like some of the best ways to expand typically are in adjacent markets because you still have that halo effect. You know, if you're 20 miles south of Boston, you expand to, you know, uh, 20 miles north of Boston. I don't know, but you get the idea. Like I've seen that that is, I don't want to call it best practice, but I've just seen, I've heard a lot of success stories uh, and it makes sense, right? Cause your marketing and your, your name sort of bleeds over. Also, you're, you, you're likely not getting into a completely different culture of people um, that could also, you know, have a different type of uh, just, you know, buying patterns, thinking when it comes to used cars. The other thing that you're bringing up, which is a really key point, that I always stress is simply like the lend lenders in our industry, the lending relationships is still very much biased towards the franchise model. Uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's the sort of the reality. And it, it it that's what kills lots of used car dealers because you are sort of at the mercy of the right lending relationships unless you are buy your payer. Uh, and most used car dealers are not. And so that is a huge issue, right? Where where I think, again, as a used car dealer, you know, if you're looking to expand, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is my lending relationships. Uh, after that, I'm thinking about location, people, inventory, da, 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 da. But lending, 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 I mean, no lenders, we no business. We were fortunate to leverage our relationships up here with, you know, with, you know, Ally Bank, Cap One, um, AmeriCredit, um, you know, we were able to, to leverage s some of those relationships that, uh, you know, if somebody else just went in there that had never started the business, they would have never been, I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have lasted at all. Um, so we were able to leverage some of that. Um, but, but it was challenging. Um, the other, you know, there are some other, 
some other interesting things too. So, but but I will say, like, I do I do commend the effort. I mean, you took a swing, didn't work out. All good. You learned from it. You know, it did work out along the way. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. We well, hit a, it. Well, well, oh, okay. Okay. There's a cliffhanger. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, dude, you're you're just getting me. You're just getting me with all these cliffhangers. We got the reinsurance. It did work out. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Hit me. What so, uh, so just going back to uh, just a, a couple of differences between Florida and and Massachusetts and doing business, right? So typically, us used car dealers, dealers in general, don't like much regulation, right? Well. Regulation sometimes can help you. Massachusetts, there is a ton of regulation. It is very, very, very difficult to get a dealer's license in any town in Massachusetts. We had a dealership under agreement for a a former dealership, by the way, another vacant one, north of Boston for a year and a half. We could not get it licensed. It was a dealership at one point. The licensing expired. We could not get it approved. We buy the store in November of 2015. I had a dealer's license from the state of Florida in 30 days. I was selling cars the second week in January, right? So that's kind of bad because there are a thousand, I mean, hundred. I don't even know how many dealers there are in Florida, but they come and they go very, very quickly. So I think the consumers might be a little bit leery of that. Like, oh, you know, are they going to be around? Are they going to be here to service me? Are they going to try to, you know, take advantage of me? Th- those sort of things. Also in Massachusetts, we have inspection stickers. You need to get one every year and they jack the car up, make sure the ball joints are tight. You know, they, they go through the car, all the lights. So that if they, if they fail inspection, check engine lights won't pass, airbag lights won't pass. If they fail inspection, that puts some customers in the market for a car or at least maybe in your service lane. Florida doesn't have anything like that, right? So that actually doesn't, you know, put cu- customers into the market. I mean, I, I tell the story. I had a guy come to the Florida store with a 91 Astro van and he wanted like 1500 bucks for it. And I'm like, it's $400. It's junk. And uh, I'm like, you're going to drive that thing out of here? Like, he's like, yep. I'm like, wow. You know, it's like, so that's just, you don't see 91 Astro vans in Massachusetts. They don't exist because <laughs> they can't very pass different market. Yeah. Very, very different. And lastly, there's a lot of games down there. I know you know this. A lot of pricing games online. Um, you know, advertising a car, you know, cash down, trade down, um, not including the reconditioning, um, a lot, a lot of games being played down there and Massachusetts, um, doesn't, you know, if, if those games are getting played, you can get in trouble with the attorney general. You don't want that. Um, so there, there are a lot of games being played. So it's really tough to compare our used cars to, to, to their used cars, um, as well. So fast forwarding, so you know this, that end of 2022, beginning of 2023 was ugly, right? I don't know if it was very, very ugly. Used car prices were falling fast. I mean, we went we went negative on the, you know, we had a, a machine up here in Massachusetts that was just, you could kind of set your watch to a set, you know, it was going to do what it was going to do. Uh, and, and, you know, we could kind of concentrate on the Florida thing. Well, when you couldn't really set your watch to it. The grosses were falling. Cars were getting old. It, you know, floor plan costs were going through the roof. We were really, really focused on this store and not as focused on that store down there. We made it much, much more difficult to, to really kind of to kind of manage that from afar um, as things got challenging here. So we got approached off market um, for a company that wanted to buy the real estate. So. I said, okay, so entertained the idea of doing that. It was equipment rental company. They came in with a number. It was a good number just to buy the real estate. <clears throat> so we agree to it. Um, we tell the team down there, we do everything right by them. Nice wind down, keep everybody on for 30 days, kept the two of the guys on until we closed. You know, we just tried to do everything the absolute right day. We have our final, final supper down there it was like, April of last year, right around this time of last year, we had the, the final, you know, take everybody out and thank you. And, and then we actually take, we had like five Highline cars. We, we would drive them down to the West Palm Beach uh, Highline sale. And wh- as we're on the way down there, we get, I get a call from the broker and says, uh, you know, 
they, they're going to back out. There's a zoning issue. They can't get the other parcel. So I'm in the car. Jason's in the car in front of me. I haven't told him yet. I'm like, you know, we're going to tell him, you know, when we get down there, I'm like, ah, you know, this is going to be bad. And then I started as the car ride was going on. I'm like, actually, you know what? I think this might be a good thing. We never went to the market. I think we can get more maybe. So I started hyping myself up. So I'm like, hey, man, I got some bad news. And and then he, the first thing out of his mouth, he's like, I think that's great news. I th- I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and so, And within like a week, we had four offers for, you know, seven, <laughs> fig- se- seven figures more than we had agreed to. So, Oh, my it, God, dude. Yeah. This is like ridiculous. I'm loving shout, it. Shout out to Carl, the real estate broker. He did a great job. <laughs> yeah. And say also shout out to inflation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the Florida market, you know, you could buy a piece of brick, so and it would go up in value. So the the count the county actually bought it to to uh basically put their ambulances there. That's who and they basically were like, We'll be the high bid by whatever it needs to be. It was crazy. I love it. Wow. So it ended up working out in the end. Yeah, it ended up working out in the end, and um, and now now we're we're back up here, and I I, th- I think there's something to what you said in terms of the growth in 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 this area, you know. Before we wrap up, Michael, um, this has been a ton of fun. I'm curious to know your thoughts on Have you ever considered going franchise? I would say absolutely not. Until listening to some of your podcasts. Oh, look at that. We're making an impact, baby. It's gotten you thinking. Huh? It's gotten the, the brains. So you know. Before the NADA show, we we went in the day early and we went to the, the buy-sell meeting that they put on there. And I don't know. You never know. You never know. Yeah, I know. And I ask, I just ask because, again, you're at a size and scale where typically you just hear of used car dealers, you know, start, you know, sniffing into the franchise business. Yeah, we always were, you know, our, our our philosophy was like, we don't want them telling us what we can do, what to do, you know, looking at it, you know, sending statements like we, we just want to do our own thing. But, you know, they, you know, the, the franchise dealer does have some advantages over us. Fixed ops, it, you know, is is a big one. Um, you know, we don't get any of that warranty work, any of that recall work, you know, that that, that that's a big driver. Any of that parts stuff that they sell to us. I mean. That, that when you talk about fixed ops absorption, I mean, in the independent space, I mean, it's not much, uh, you know, I, oh, our yeah. front, our front and back and dock fee attribute 75% of our total gross for the month, you know, the 25% of it is the service department, but some of that number, half of that number is baked in on what we're servicing on our own cars. So it's, uh, so, you know, to have that fixed ops absorption would be, would be amazing. Um, but, you know, independents typically don't get that. I have a feeling like, I have a feeling that by the next time we chat, you'll be a franchise dealer as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's just throw that out there. We'll see. Incredible. Michael, this has been a ton of fun. Learned a lot. And I appreciate you being so transparent. Really, really awesome. We'll throw up your link in the show notes. Also, what's your contact info if anyone once again talked with you? Yeah, it's easy. Just email me, Mike at Borns.com, B-O-U-R-N-E-S.com. Cool. I love it. And if we get enough, uh, if we get enough interest from the independent world, maybe we'll set up this uh, independent 20 group as well. That'll be I, fun. I, it, it would be awesome. It, re- it really would. And I know, I know all the big ones, so we could start a hit list and, um, you know, it, it would be, uh, it would be really good. Um, I want to let you know that, you know, I know you were anonymous for a while, but I spent a lot of time trying to figure out who you were and I did find out yeah? before an ADA. Uh, oh no. <laughs> H- how'd you find out? How'd you do it? I can't, I can't reveal my sources. Oh, okay. So it was, it was a leak, a leak. That's all good. Well, no, someone, you, you know how <laughs> someone actually had found out this was, I, I was shocked because I thought I was pretty good at this. Right. Um, but someone, what they did was they saw the lawyer I used to trademark the car dealership guy logo. And then they looked at other trademarks by that lawyer and they saw my prior company. And so they put two and two <laughs> together. Like, I was like, wow. I was like, that is creative. So anyways, that was a funny one. Well, I appreciate you being so supportive and, uh, you know, really engaging with the brand. It's really awesome. Honestly, it's, you know, what you're doing is great for us because there, 
there's not a lot of good source, you know, to get good information. I've, I can't tell you how many times in a, our management meeting I've, you know, showed something or a stat that you brought up. And I actually thought it was funny the other day. I know you did a pod about stolen vehicles or something. And in my email box, like the next day is one of the industry publications and the headline is stolen. Via. I'm like, they're just, they just ripped that off of you pretty much. Wait. You know? <laughs> so send that to me. I want to see that. You forward, yeah. forward that to me after. So yeah, this just uh, I will. Like this week. Yeah, so I will. Kind of the trend for the for the you know the yeah. hot topics in the industry and really and yeah, there's definitely great. a lot of um you know definitely sets in discourse. It's just something that's interesting. I will give a plug to. I know you're talking about Melissa from Lojack, but something interesting that um, I learned the other day, and, I, and I'll give a shout out to Eastern Motors for this. Uh, but they told me that they basically put the LoJack device on every vehicle um, because, super interesting, it's considered a back-end product that cannot be charged back to the dealer. And so it's almost like treated like front-end. So again, for anyone listening that doesn't get this concept right, back-end, if you sell like a vehicle service contract, gap insurance to a customer, if they cancel that product, right, that gets charged back to you as a dealer. Right, it's like funny money almost because you don't actually make all that money until the customer pays it all off, and more likely than not, you're going to pay off. You know, you're going to pay back a certain percentage of that product once the customer cancels it. That's just how it works. But it's interesting that you know there's a class of products, and this you know this specific LoJack product falls into that, um, where you actually don't get charged back. So I just found that interesting um, because you know I had a conversation with Joel from Easterns after the. The conversation with, or after that podcast, um, and and also full disclosure, Lojack is a sponsor of the podcast, so I want to disclose that as well. For Massachusetts based company too. They were founded in Massachusetts, eh? Yeah, but I just found it really interesting that um, you know it's not charged back, and that anyways. So Easterns said that they use that, and again, it's this is not the only product that can fall into this uh, category. So you know, by all means, you know do your homework. Uh, but anyways, I just found that interesting. And, you know, when you speak about kind of, you know, we're in a 5% margin business, it is a good way to be able to, you know, not, just take less risk and retain more of that margin. So anyways, that's and my closing thought. Theft, dealership theft is on the rise. Um, we, we got hit, uh, here. Um, so it's in that those, those are the worst days we had. We just, we, we just had um, people break in uh, like two Sundays ago and our, our camera system got them, thankfully, but, you know, got them off the site. But it's it's very much had, on the we rise. Had to, we had to upgrade our system big time to all live monitoring and everything. It's it's been been tough. I, I, I also tweeted this the other day, which I think could be helpful to lots of people, but put an air tag on your dealer tags. Right. So all your dealer tags buy from Amazon, just like, you know, otter box for air tags. That's like, you know, wind, hail, rain, sleet, shot, whatever proof. Put on air tag on it and then screw it or like glue it or something to the back of the dealer tag. I can't tell you how many times this has saved us in the past. It was just, and it, look, it doesn't matter how good your your dealer tag tracking system is and your your log and it doesn't matter. Just do it. It's like so easy. And for that one customer that leaves it on their car and drives home or the salesperson, it's just like, oh, there it is. So it, that also comes up huge. We're, de we're demoing a, a, um, a different, they're doing it a different way because if it falls off on the highway or something like that, you know, you got to have the Bluetooth to use, be able to use the air tag. But, um, you know, we we're using a GPS yeah. one. The bottom line is like, you know, we're talking about tracking cars. That's one thing, but also track your dealer tags. I mean, it's huge. Yeah, so hundred percent. Yeah. Anyways, we're getting into esoteric territory here. So, uh, Michael, had a ton of fun. Thanks for coming on. And uh, we'd have to do this again at some point in the future. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for what you do. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating. Consider subscribing to the show. And check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.